everybody video here for you today pretty long one i do a lot of reading those of you who have followed my channel know i've covered many ruins in this area of the world that go back 10 12 000 years gobekli tepe seems to be in the center of that area so what i would thought i would do today is read an archaeological report from klaus schmidt on gobekli tepe right down here I have concentrated a lot on sites around Gobekli Tepe, but today I thought I'd concentrate big time on Gobekli Tepe. A lot of us have read Graham Hancock, maybe Andrew Collins, other people's interpretation of what was found here, but I thought it's important to read what the head archeologist found here. Now, Klaus Schmidt, I believe he passed away, I think about three or four years ago, but man, he has to be given a lot of credit for one, recognizing the importance of this site. And I think that's because he worked at the nearby site in the Valley Chorai before coming to Gobekli Tepe and realizing how old the site was. But he deserves a lot of credit. So I'm just gonna read his whole archeological report from about 10 years ago. So I'm not gonna waste any more time. Let's just get to it. Here is the PDF written in 2010 by Klaus Schmidt, Gobekli Tepe, the Stone Age Sanctuaries, new results of ongoing excavations with a special focus on sculptures and high relief. The transition from non-producing to farming societies first took place during the pre-pottery Neolithic of the Near East. It happened immediately after the end of the Pleistocene between the 10th and 8th millennium BC. One of the main questions that have exercised the minds of generations of archeologists is why people first gave up hunting and gathering way of life to start domesticating plants and animals. In other words, why did the Neolithic revolution take place? The new discoveries at Gobekli Tepe have turned up evidence for explanations that differ from the generally accepted wisdom on the issue. Gobekli Tepe is one of the most fascinating Neolithic sites in the world. It is a tell, an artificial mound dating to the pre-pottery Neolithic. It was not used for habitation. It consists of several sanctuaries in the form of round megalithic enclosures. The site lies about 15 kilometers northeast of the Turkish city of San Lurfa at the highest point of an extended mountain range that can be seen for many kilometers around. It is a landmark visible from far away. Its enormous deposition of layers up to 15 meters high have accumulated over several millennia over an area of about nine hectares. Even today, the place has lost nothing of its magic appeal. For example, a wishing tree, which stands on top of the ridge, is still sought out by residents of the surrounding area Archaeologists found an important piece of the puzzle in the early history of humanity at the site, which contributes to a completely new understanding of the process of sedentism in the beginning of agriculture. The hill, which is strewn with countless stone implements and large format, regular shaped ashlars, revealed its secrets as a result of the excavations carried out since 1995 by the German Archaeological Institute in cooperation with the Archaeological Museum in San Lorfa. Remarkably, no residential buildings have been discovered. However, at least two phases of monumental religious architecture have been uncovered. Of these, the older layer is the most impressive. The main features are T-shaped monolithic pillars, each weighing several tons. They were erected to form large circular enclosures at the center of which a pair of these pillars towers overall. The diameters of the circles are between 10 and 20 meters and 10 to 12 pillars of the circle are connected by walls of the quarry. The enclosures have been designated A, B, C, and D in a range according to the date of their discovery in the first years of excavations. Later enclosures E, F, and G were added, but they do not show the monumentality of the other four, and these later enclosures are not discussed fully in this paper. The age of layer three and the monumental enclosures is impressive. They can be dated to the 10th millennium. BC, a time when people all over the world were still living as hunter-gatherers except in the region of the fertile crescent of the Near East, where people had started to settle in permanent villages and begin activities which led to the, domestic, to the domestication of plants and animals. There is no question that the site of Gobekli Tepe was not a mundane settlement of the period, but a site belonging to the religious sphere, a sacred area since the excavations have revealed no residential buildings Gobekli Tepe seems to have been a regional center where communities met to engage in complex rites. 
The younger layer, Gobekli Tepe, has been dated to the 9th millennium BC. It has been demonstrated that some domesticated plants and animals were already in use during this millennium and that the elaborate settlements had been built, such as Navali Chorai, which lies 50 kilometers to the north, the site now submerged by the flooding of the Aturic Dam in 1992. The excavation caused a sensation in the 1980s as it opened for the first time a new window on a previously unexpected world of Stone Age culture. The type of dwelling excavated at Valley Chorai with a li living space in front and a rectangular area behind for storing provisions may be considered the prototype of Anatolian farmhouse that can still be found today. Even then, the houses were up to 6 meters wide and 18 meters long. There is a look at some of the excavated areas at Gobekli Tepe. But Gobekli Tepe differs from Navali Chorai. Layer 2 is not a settlement, but it contains a series of sanctuaries. However, the large circular structures of Layer 3 disappeared to be replaced by small rectangular rooms. But the main features of the monumental enclosures, the T-shaped pillars survived. Therefore, the buildings of Layer 2, again, can be identified as sanctuaries but it is not only the scale of the architecture that was reduced, the numbers and the size of the pillars are much smaller now. The average height of the pillars in layers three is 3.5 meters, while in layer two, it is only about 1.5 meters. The pillars are made from a very hard and quite crystalline limestone. They are the most durable objects at the site to produce monoliths with a length of four to five, sometimes even seven meters. Neolithic people needed limestone of supreme quality, which cannot be found everywhere. This is one reason the sanctuaries were erected at Gobekli Tepe Plateau, as it consists of a limestone of such quality. The pillars are usually connected by the walls, which define the inner and outer spaces of the enclosures. The walls are built mainly from ashlar stone, sometimes including spoilae, fragments of pillars and other shaped stones common at the site. In secondary use as wall stones, there is a two centimeter thick layer of clay mortar between the stones. The mortar causes a serious problem for the conservation of the site. Rainwater is disastrous for it, as the soft clay is easily washed out by the water. The same problem exists with alien forces. Wind erosion, again, is a big problem. And there is a third danger. Insects like to build nests in the spaces between the stones as the clay mortar is very soft and holes are dug easily. The mortar may originally have been tempered, but the preservation conditions for any organic remains are very bad, with the exceptions of bones, which exist in huge amounts. But there are almost no other organic remains, as the use of fire at the site has not been noted. It says, it has been a great advantage to archaeology that, after a period of unknown duration, the sanctuaries of the older layer at Gobekli Tepe were intentionally and rapidly buried, a process which seems to have been a certain part of their use from the beginning. The older surfaces that can be observed in the excavations and the processes that occurred in the sediment have been subjected to pediological analysis, allowing the filling to be dated Moreover, the circumstances in which the structures are filled are a matter for speculation. Was the act of filling part of some ritual? Was the ritual carried out repeatedly? The origin of the filling material is unknown. The provenance of the material is not unimportant, as some 500 cubic meters of debris would be required to backfill enclosure D alone. Moreover, the material is not sterile soil. It consists of many chips and pieces of limestone, usually smaller than fist size, and many artifacts, mainly a flint, but also fragments of stone vessels, grindstones, and other ground stone tools. Besides the stone artifacts, there are many animal bones, mostly broken into small pieces. As is usual for waste, the bones are prim primarily of gazelle, but in terms of weight of meat, wild cattle is the most important species. Other species of importance are red deer, onager, wild pig, and wild caprovids. There are no domesticated animals or plants. The enclosures date to the period of transition from hunter-gatherer to farmer societies during the 10th and 9th millennium in the Near East. 
It should be mentioned that bone material from the back filling includes some human bones. Their appearance is similar to the animal bones. They were broken into small pieces. Several have cut marks and it appears they were treated in a similar way to the animal bones. As a study of these finds is in progress, no final results can be given here. While cannibalism as an explanation of the appearance of bones within the remains of hunted animals cannot be excluded, it seems probable that these bones attest to the special treatment of the human body after death, a custom known from many pre-pottery Neolithic sites in the Near East. It seems probable that the presence of human bones in the filling material should strengthen the hypothesis that there are primary burials somewhere at Gobekli Tepe, burials which were opened after some time for a continuation of very specific rituals performed with the dead. In recent excavation seasons, surprisingly new discoveries were made in Layer 3. The floor was reached in Enclosure C and D, which has been under excavation for over 10 years. A terrazzo floor was predicted as such a floor had been excavated in Enclosure B. But in both enclosures, the floor was natural bedrock, carefully smooth. As in Enclosure E, the, the so-called Felsen Temple, located outside the mound at the Western Plateau, Two pedestals, where a central pair of T-shaped pillars was erected, were cut out of the bedrock in the center of both enclosures C and D. But unlike enclosure E, where no pillars or walls survived the millennia, or enclosure C, where the central pillars were destroyed in antiquity, both central pillars and enclosure D survived with no damage and with a breathtaking height of 5.5 meters having stood in situ for more than 11,000 years. There is only a small problem regarding their stability, as slow pressure has caused the pillars to shift into a slightly oblique position. Without support, much better without re-erection of both pillars into a vertical stable position, both would fall down after the removal of the surrounding sediment, which covered the enclosure completely before excavation, being the result of the backfilling process during the pre-pottery Neolithic period. The stabilization of both pillars work began in 2009, was one of the main goals of the 2010 spring season, a task which has been completed successfully in splendid fashion. At this point, it must be mentioned that the general goal of the excavations is not to reconstruct Neolithic architecture, but to expose several of the important monuments to understand their meaning and to keep in their original fine spots and protect them from weather and other destructive forces. Only in some, in some exceptions can pillars or other parts of the architecture not remain in their original positions. The pillars in Enclosure D, which had to be re-erected to enable excavations to continue there, the T form of the pillars can easily be interpreted as anthropomorphic, and some of the pillars appear to have arms and hands. Undoubtedly human, they are, in other words, stone statues of human-like beings. The head is represented by, cross, by a cross on the pillars, and interpretation supporting by the pillar from the Valley Chorai, where a longer face section and a shorter back of the head are observable corresponding to their natural proportions. The head is represented by the cross on the pillars and interpretation supported by a pillar from the Valley Chorai where a longer face section and a shorter back of the head are observable, corresponding to the natural proportions of the human head. Differentiation of the sexes was evidently not intended. It is also clear that the minimalist form of the representation was intentional because other statues and reliefs found at the site offer sufficient proof of the artist's ability to produce naturalist work. Very often, a specific attribute is depicted on the pillars. Two bands in flat relief are visible on the front of the shafts, somewhat resembling a stole, and it is highly probable that this motif actually refers to a specific garment. It is possible that only certain persons were permitted to wear the stole, being an important element of a ritual robe. Perhaps the stone buttons, which occur in large numbers at Quebecli Tepe, are from a robe of this type. An important role must also be ascribed to the pair of pillars at the center of each space, which tower over the other, other pillars. 
it seems probable that they depict twins, because twins, or at least pairs of brothers or sisters, are a common theme in mythology. The explanation that they may simply represent the classic duality of man and woman can be excluded after a recent discovery in Enclosure D, the central pair of pillars, pillars 18 and 31, and their flat reliefs depicting arms have been visible for several years. The western pillar is wearing a necklace in the form of a brucranium, the eastern one a necklace in the shape of a crescent, a disc, and a motif, two anathletical elements whose meaning is not understood. This eastern pillar also holds a fox in the crook of its elbow. In the 2009 season, the previously hidden lower parts of the pillar shafts were excavated. It was no surprise when hands and fingers soon became visible, but a few hours later, a sensational discovery was made. Both pillars were wearing belts depicted in flat relief just below the hands. A belt buckle is visible in both cases, and on the eastern pillar, there are decorations on the belt in the form of H and C-shaped C figures. However, there is an even more interesting feature. A loincloth covering the genital region hangs from each of the belts. The hind legs and tail of what appears to be fox pelts are visible. The loincloth covers the genital region, so the sex of the two individuals is unclear. But since the several clay figurines with belts found at the pre-pottery Neolithic site and the Valley Chorai are all male, it seems highly probable that the pair of statues in Enclosure D are also male. The flat reliefs on the T-shaped pillars, often the pillars are elusively decorated with reliefs. The motifs often depict animals, but there are some abstract symbols, mainly in the form of the letter H, both in its original position or rotated through 90 degrees. Other symbols are crescents, discs, and anesthetic motifs, and there are two depictions of humans. The first was found on a pillar in Enclosure D, is presumed to be an ithophallic, headless man. The second is on a pillar. In Enclosure F, a standing person with a long neck and a head is depicted. Above the person is a small dog recognizable by its tail bent over the back. However, the reliefs adorning many of the monumental pillars depict a wide range of wild animals such as predatory cats, Bulls, wild boars, foxes, ducks, cranes, gazelles, wild asses, snakes, spiders, and scorpions. In the spring season of 2010, north of Pillar 18, in the backfill material of Enclosure D, a decorated pillar fragment was discovered. The object was probably part of the missing 12 pillar of the enclosure, as there is a gap between Pillars 43 and 30 in the northern section of the enclosure. The depiction shows a vulture and the species as yet unknown among the images at Quebecli Tepe, the long coarse ridge of mane along the length of the back of the animal indicates that it's a hyena. These reliefs open a view of a new and unique pictorial language not known before whose interpretation is a matter of important scientific debate. So far as can be seen, the mammals depicted are male. It remains a mystery whether the relief images were attributes of the pillars or whether they were part of a mythological cycle. They may have a protective aspect serving as guards, or perhaps, more probably, are part of a horrific scenario, somewhat like Dante's Inferno. And I find that interesting because we know the nearby site of Abu Herrera was taken out 12,800 years ago by an impact event. The animal reliefs are quite naturalistic and correspond to the fauna of the period. However, the animals depicted need not necessarily have played a special role in people's everyday lives. As game, for example, they were rather part of a mythological world, which we have already encountered in cave paintings. The important thing is that the fabulous or mythical creatures, such as centaurs or the sphinx, winged bulls or horses, do not yet occur in the iconography and therefore in the mythology of prehistoric times. These creatures must be recognized as creatures of higher cultures, which arose later. In this context, it has to be mentioned that there is the exception of anthropomorphic beings with animal heads, a group which can be summarized under the term go demon, creatures already known from other Paleolithic art, but so far not seen at Gobekli Tepe, 
Another exception is the so-called Birdman, a sculpture excavated at Navali Chorai, whose meaning is unclear. Akobekli Tepe, distinctly female motifs are lacking from both animal and human images. There is a single exception, a naked woman engraved on a stone slab placed between the so-called lion's pillars. But it says, it seems clear that this depiction is not part of the original decoration, but probably belongs to a group of engravings which can be classified as graffiti. In the Valley Chora, in contrast of the clay figurines that have been found nowhere else in such abundance, 700 in number, over 90% are anthropomorphic objects and male and female figures occur in equal numbers. The complete absence of clay figurines at Quebecli Tepe is most remarkable. This surely reflects the different functions of the ritual buildings at each location. While the buildings of Gobekli Tepe have a possible connection with burial customs, and the Valley Chorai, it is possible to examine a village settlement in everyday life. The use of clay as a material for the male and female figures found here is not insignificant. The smaller stone figures that were also discovered exhibit a completely different and much richer iconographic repertoire, which repeats a stock of motifs associated with the large stone sculptures and reliefs at Gobekli Tepe. It is now clear that the T-shaped pillars have an anthropomorphic identity, but who are they? As their faces were never depicted, they seem to be impersonal, supernatural beings from another world, beings gathered at Gobekli Tepe for certain so far unknown purposes. Their identity is obviously different, from that of several life-size or more or less naturally depicted human heads found at Gobekli Tepe on the basis of one completely preserved limestone statue found at Urfa, not Gobekli Tepe, which is male and dates of the early Neolithic. It seems that the limestone heads are probably statues of male personages. This completely preserved 1.8 meter tall limestone sculpture was discovered in the 1990s in the old town north of Likukal, where an important Islamic sanctuary is located. According to the tradition, the prophet Abraham was born in a cave near the springs and lakes nearby. Several observations attest of the pre-pottery Neolithic site north of the springs, which was destroyed by immense construction works in the 1990s or sealed by the old town of Urfa in medieval times. Fortunately, at least a statue survived. It is a find whose provenance from the pre-pottery Neolithic site of Balikalgal mentioned above has a hairy, very high probability. The statue has a face, the eyes are deep holes and black obsidian blade segments struck from bi-directional cores. It may be noteworthy that no mouth was depicted. The statue seems to be naked with the exception of a V-shaped necklace. It is not entirely clear, but seems that the hands are holding the phallus. Legs are not depicted below the body is a conical tap, which easily allows the setting of the statue in the ground in a way quite similar to that of the early dynastic foundation figurines of ancient Mesopotamia deposited in the corners of the sacred buildings. The so-called skinhead, discovered at Navali Chorai, a life-size human head with a snake atop, recalling the Egyptian Uraeus snake, which protects the pharaoh, seems to belong to a similar statue Unfortunately, the face was deliberately destroyed sometime in the Neolithic. The remaining part of the head was used as spoiler in the northern wall of the Terrazzo building, where the T-shaped pillars were discovered in the 1980s for the first time in the world. The snake clearly underlines the importance of the person, but as a skinhead was found in the wall of the Terrazzo building with its T-shaped pillars, it seems the most probable that the status of the person depicted by the sculpture is much below that of the T-shaped pillar statues. But there, a serpent on the back of the skull, and since we had an impact event nearby, a little further back in history, did, this, did these people just have the serpent or the comet literally right on their mind? And this right here is the statue that was described, 1.8 meters tall, no mouth, V-shaped necklace, or is that a collar? I guess that is all up for debate, but certainly some symbolism there. Let's just go on and read here. It says, in answer to the question, who are the T-shapes? Maybe a little easier when these non-stylized statues are taken into account. 
The more or less naturalistically depicted statues seem to represent members of our world, powerful and important, but inferior to the T-shapes, who remain in mysterious faceless anonymity. The T-shapes seem to belong to the other world. The non-stylized statues seem to have the role of guardians of the sacred sphere. There are two other nearly life-size limestone sculptures of human heads at Navali Chorai. They belong to composite motifs reminiscent of totem poles of the Native Americans of the northwest coast. One head is placed in front of a large bird, probably a vulture, which seems to be holding the head in its claws. Unfortunately, the lower and upper parts of this sculpture are not preserved. Therefore, the preserved part of the sculpture could be only the medial part of the possibly much larger composite statue, which, stressing comparisons with totem poles again, originally included many other motifs. A similar situation is visible on a second object. Another large bird is clasping in its claws two human heads. Unfortunately, this fascinating sculpture was destroyed sometime in the pre-pottery Neolithic, and only some pieces survived, buried in the northeastern bench of the Terrazzo building, where they were discovered when the bench was removed at the end of the excavations. But the overwhelming majority of the elements of this sculpture, which again was originally a li little similar to a totem pole made of limestone, are lost. A recently discovered sculpture from Gobekli Tepe, which has to be analyzed in detail in the near future, may help us understand better the meaning of this object. These sculptures are mentioned here to demonstrate that clearly not all life-size human heads belong to the statues of guardians. There are more variants of art objects where three-dimensional sculptured human heads would have been used. From Gobekli Tepe, one example fits into the group bird, animal, and human head. This motif is probably related to the well-attested skull cult of pre-pottery Neolithic cultures. Four human heads are known from Gobekli Tepe. They probably belong to the sculptures similar to the Urfa statue. And I'm just not real familiar with faces or human heads found at Gobekli Tepe at all. It says the first was discovered in 1998 in the filling debris of a building complex, which was erected in superposition to the enclosure. Again, the mouth is not depicted there are two other pieces which are not well preserved. The fourth life-size human head was discovered at Gobekli Tepe in the spring of 2010 in filling debris directly east of Pillar 31 in the western central pillar of Enclosure D. It is broken at the neck and there is damage around the mouth, but the rest of the head is preserved quite well. Its fine spot can be understood as an offering of the head during the filling process of Enclosure D. The life-size human heads from the site in the Urfa region are listed in Table 1. A medium-sized statue found in 2008 at Quebecli Tepe could represent a further category of statues, particularly with regard to its less than life-size dimensions and the body being reminiscent of the Beter statuan of the New Sumerian period in Lower Mesopotamia. We are far from a final assignment of these objects, but the appearance of this statue the face looking slightly upwards at someone much more powerful, the hands in front of the body, but without presenting the male genitals, which remain invisible. All these elements seem to corroborate this statue shares its main characteristics with the new Sumerian better statuan. That is a statue I've never seen before coming from Gobekli Tepe. In the 2009 campaign, a second excavation field was opened in the northwestern hilltop of the mound. As expected, architecture typical of layer two with small rectangular rooms and small T-shaped pillars appeared in most of the trenches. A flat relief is visible on the surface of one of these monoliths, easily identified as the upper arm of the pillar, as the depictions of arms is very common attribute in layer two underlying, underlying the anthropomorphic meaning of these objects. And I'm not sure if I have seen that life-size human head coming from Gobekli Tepe, but I did the video on Karahan Tepe about a month ago, where a skull like this was carved right out of the bedrock, right into the bedrock, I should say. It says, but the layer two structures did not cover the eastern row of the new trenches under surface layer one, a layer characterized by dark humus sediments produced by farming on the site, a brownish gray sediment appeared 
It included a lot of limestone gravel, but almost no stones larger than fist size. Such sediment is typical of the filling debris of the enclosure of layer three. Expectations that a structure of layer three lay below the filling was soon justified as part of a megalithic pillar was found to all appearances in situ. There is no question that this pillar is part of a so far unknown enclosure that has not been detected by geophysical investigations in previous seasons. What is not clear is the extent and orientation of the new structure. Now, of course, I will leave this link below if you want to check out these pics. Here's what they call a porthole stone from Enclosure B. Pretty interesting stonework coming from 11, 12,000 years ago. It says, the discovery of a so far unknown megalithic enclosure in the new excavation areas on the northwestern hilltop was in fact not really a surprise, as it is known that geophysical methods do not map structures buried deep below the surface. The single monumental pillar found in this area was nearly one meter below the surface. Other pillars which can be expected to belong to the structure have not been discovered, which obviously can be explained by the suggestion that the missing pillars and walls are buried quite deeply. Therefore, they remained invisible in the geophysical record. Remember, this is written in 2010, so some of these areas might have been excavated. It says, but another find from these areas is unique and so far very exciting. It belongs to the group of so-called porthole stones. All these objects in this category share general characteristics. One face of the stones, the face we may call the lower face, is always completely plain, while the upper face, there is a high and broad collar around a central, usually a rectangular hole. In appearance, these objects somewhat resemble an oversized hat with a broad brim. Indifference to real hats being in that the center of the object, there is a large rectangular hole, which could originally have been used to crawl through the stone. Similar stone objects are well known from megalithic barrows of Atlantic Europe. Stone slabs with a central hole were placed in several barrels vertically so that the stones define the entrance leading into the darkness of the grave. At Gobekli Tepe, quite similar stones exist in monumental dimensions. One line on the north northern slope of the southeast plateau is over three meters in length. The most are of medium size and some are miniature, which can only be understood as they are being models of larger ones that can actually allow a person to crawl through the porthole. The porthole stones at Gobekli Tepe are known from the beginning of the investigations. A quite large example was observed during the author's first visit to the site in 1994. The stone, broken in several pieces, but nearly complete, was visible in a stone heap in the depression between the northwestern and southwestern hilltop. Unfortunately, however, the object disappeared during the ensuing years as the site was affected by stone robbery until the excavations of the site were fu fully established in 1996. Smaller fragments of uh, porthole stones were found scattered all over the mound. During the survey of 1995, these objects were called portable pillar base at the time because the similarity observed between these objects and the two pedestals of the so-called rock temple, a structure cut out of the natural bedrock, now numbered as enclosure E. Pedestals have an oval tub-shaped hole in the middle of the object already in the first year of investigations, 1995. An explanation was given for them, which has now been confirmed. They were identified as the basis of the now lost central pillars of the rock temple function of the holes was reconstructed such that the lower part of the pillars was set and fixed there. During the excavations of the Enclosure C in 2008 and Enclosure D in 2009, both pairs of central pillars were found still in situ. Their bases are placed exactly in the way as the rock pedestals, as supposed in 1995 in the case of Enclosure E. The more or less close similarity between the rock pedestals and the objects now called porthole stones was the reason was the reason for the original designation portable pillar bases but during 16 years of excavations many fragments of such stones have been discovered in both layers 2 and 3 
although no situation has ever been found confirming the suggestion that the feet of the pillars were fixed by such portable stone frames, a medium stone of this group, for example, was found in the center of enclosure B, immediately in front of the central pillars. Its function was obviously that of a porthole stone. It is only unclear if the stone was placed vertically in the enclosure wall or horizontally in the middle of the roof, if a roof existed, this being an unanswered question. Returning to the new trenches on the northwestern hilltop, a megalithic porthole stone was discovered south of the single monumental pillar in the new trenches the stone appeared, appeared in an oblique position on top of the debris, which should belong to layer three, given its composition of mainly stone smaller than fist size with quantities of earth or clay between. The object of it is similar monumental dimensions to the porthole stones on the southeast plateau mentioned above. The excavated stone lost some parts of its rim, but the remaining piece nearly three by three meters is unbroken. What never was observable on the more or less complete or fragmented portal stones excavated so far, at Gobekli Tepe now can be seen. The stone has two portholes, two adjacent rectangular openings, but this so far unique double porthole is not the only astonishing feature. On the southern rim is a flat relief of a very large snake. On the western rim are high reliefs of three animals. In a direction from south to north, a bull, a billy goat, and a predator showing his teeth are positioned. A high relief with a very similar animal is found in the same season. In the northern profile of a trench in the western, in the west part of enclosure D, again, the tail of the beast is curved at its back. The representation of the motif underlines the observation that there was a fixed canon of depictions which was unveiled step by step, year by year. At present, it is not possible to present an interpretation of the shape with its two entrances and the decoration of the porthole stone. It is not clear if the porthole stone is just lying in the debris separate from other structures or if it belongs to an architectural context like the porthole stone found in enclosure B 10 years ago. But we can recognize that pillars were not the only objects to which high reliefs were added, as seen in the case of the predator sitting on the stomach of Pillar 27, a masterpiece of stone masonry. Several high reliefs on limestone slabs of unknown size and shape now seem to have originally been parts of porthole stones. The predator found atop the wall east of Pillar 36 in Enclosure C. It is not the first time that animals have been found depicted on the rim of porthole stone at Gobekli Tepe. There are several fragments with relief, but the motifs are quite small, or the preservation of the surfaces was so poor that there remain doubts as to whether a relief was present. It is possible that the form in question was not an image, but an irregularity in the stone. But there is a porthole stone with a serpent a bull, a few other animals there. And you notice those little cup marks all around the porthole stone. That is pretty interesting. Here in figure 25, it says high relief of a predator on a stone slab, probably part of a rim of a porthole stone from the bulk west of enclosure D, length 53 centimeters. Not sure if I've ever seen that before. But it said, at the so-called Lion's Gate at the entrance of the Dromos, a structure south of Enclosure C, which has not been completely excavated, a second type of porthole stone without a collar around the stone has been discovered. Placed vertically at the entrance was a limestone slab of a flat relief of a wild boar below the porthole. The animal is depicted upside down, lying on its back, legs stretched away from the body. While there remain some doubts as to whether the stone was originally made just for this purpose or used in its current position in its secondary function, it seems most probable that the porthole, that the port stone and its depiction symbolizing the broader sphere of death, which is entered by crawling through the hole. That is very interesting. It says, however, the further investigations and finds will clarify this question. Here is a pic of that porthole stone with the boar upside down. It says fragmented porthole stone with 
the relief of a boar depicted side down. The stone slab is defining the entrance into the dromo south of enclosure C. Very interesting pics in this PDF. It says, recent discoveries provide overwhelming evidence that a porthole stone could be decorated not only in flat relief, but also with three-dimensional sculpture. Several types of work stone were used for art. T-shaped pillars, both variants of porthole stone, with and without collars, kidney-shaped stone slabs, usually covering stone benches, and large stone rings of unknown function, reminiscent of the heavy stone rings used by ancient Mesoamericans and ball games. The megalithic objects and types of decorations are listed in Table 2. Conclusion, the transitional period of the late Pleistocene to the early Holocene in the southwestern Asia saw the emergence of the first large permanently settled communities. Permanent settlements dating to 12,000 to 10,000 years before present, currently under excavation, are producing unexpected monumentality and extraordinary rich symbolism that challenges our ability to interpret, especially in Upper Mesopotamia, in the center of the so-called Fertile Crescent, Large sites with exciting finds have been unearthed in recent years. The results of these ongoing excavations have not turned our picture of world history upside down, but they are adding a splendid and colorful new chapter between the period. Hunter-gatherers of the Ice Age and the New World of the food-producing cultures of the Neolithic period, the extent of which had not been predicted some years ago a chapter which is enlarged year by year by the ongoing excavations at pre-pottery Neolithic sites in the Levant and Upper Mesopotamia, the evolution of modern humanity involved in a fundamental change from small-scale mobile hunter-gatherer bands to large permanently co-resident communities following the ideas of Trevor Watkins, to whom I am grateful for long discussions and much inspiration on this subject, we observed that Jacques Coven's suggestions were correct in 1997. The factor that allowed the formation of large permanent communities was the facility to use symbolic culture, a kind of pre-literate capacity for producing and reading symbolic material culture that enabled communities to formulate their shared identities and their cosmos. There has been much progress in the investigation of the earliest signs of symbolic behavior, followed by the earliest figural representation in European Upper Paleolithic art from 30,000 years ago. Now, the 12,000-year-old sites in Upper Mesopotamia make us believe that something new and very important was happening. We are finding our way back to quite the fusionistic point of view when we observe the success of people in possession of the Neolithic package, which first occupied in its first complete form the Upper or the northern Levant and upper Mesopotamia, between the upper Euphrates and the upper Tigris. From these regions, the new way of life was disseminated across the old world from the 9th millennium BC onwards, reaching Europe and Africa in the late 7th millennium. It says Gobekli Tepe opens a new perspective on the early Neolithic. Specialization on particular tasks must have been possible in order for members of the community to be able to erect these monuments and decorate them so elaborately. We can assume that much older traces and constructions have yet to be found at Gobekli Tepe, and it can be guessed that the place has a history stretching back over several thousand years to the Old Stone Age. The people must have had highly complicated mythology, including the capacity for abstraction. The question of who is represented by the highly stylized T-shaped pillars remains open, as we cannot say with certitude if the concepts of God existed at that time. So the general function of the enclosures remains mysterious, but it is clear that the pillars, the pillar statues in the center of these enclosures represented very powerful beings. If gods existed, in the minds of early Neolithic people, there is an overwhelming probability that the T-shape is the first known monumental depiction of the gods. Further investigations were, will certainly provide us with more detailed information, but to understand the new finds, archeologists need to work closely with the specialists in comparative religion, architectural and art theory, cognitive and evolutionary psychology, socialists using social network theory and others 
It is the complex story of the earliest large settled communities, their extensive networking, and their communal understandings of their world, perhaps even the first organized religions and their symbolics and their symbolic representations of the cosmos. Whew. That was a long one, but I certainly learned a lot. If you want to check out this, I will leave this link below. A lot of a lot of fascinating pics in here, some that I have really never seen before. I really didn't want to edit this too much. I only allowed myself a certain amount of time for this video. But there is a look at Gobekli Tepe, porthole stones, cut marks on the very tops of the pillars. It's all very interesting. I hope you thought this was enjoyable, learned a lot, and I hope you all have a very nice day.